career development chat uh, on Twitter with the hashtag GSA Career De Dev and hashtag Workshop Wednesday. Let me stop sharing this. All right, and let me introduce our panelists. Um, so they'll introduce themselves briefly by talking about their current position, their institute, and how they got there. And let's start with Dr. Terry McGlynn. Hi. Uh, so I'm currently a professor at Cal State Dominguez Hills, which is in LA. Um, and I'm also, all of my teaching is currently reassigned to be the director of undergraduate research and running that office. Um, before that, I was a faculty member at the University of San Diego, which is a Catholic and wealthy private institution. And before that, I was a visiting assistant professor for a year at Gettysburg College. Um, so I've seen a variety of kinds of institutions. Um, the reason I wanted to work at a PUI initially is, uh, frankly, I didn't want to have my grantsmanship be uh, responsible for the livelihood of other people. I didn't want to run a lab and have people count on, on me for that. Um, in hindsight, that probably was a really bad reason um, because really people are still counting on me to raise grants to get them opportunities. And if I don't have these grants, they don't have those opportunities. Um, so that pressure is still there nonetheless. Anyway, uh, uh, one general tip I would have would be um, uh, check your assumptions about about any particular PUI or the PUI experience. And that's particularly true if you as an undergraduate went to a small liberal arts college or some other PUI because uh, the experience from the student is really different from the experience of the faculty member and you don't really see that part of that life. So, Thank you, Terry. Uh, and then we'll hear from Dr. Diane Pater. Um, hi, I am currently an assistant professor of biology at Vassar College in New York. Um, prior to that, I was a visiting assistant professor at Amherst College in Massachusetts. Um, both of those are small liberal arts colleges, um, very selective with um, admissions. Um, and I sought a position at PUI. So I actually um, went directly into my visiting assistant professor position at Amherst out of grad school. I got the position while I was still in graduate school at UCSD. Um, I decided while I was at UCSD um, that I wanted to be able to work with students more directly, um, offer mentorship, um, get to know my students, um, because I saw that the students that I had there were really seeking some kind of connection with someone to offer some mentorship and some advice. Um, and that was really kind of my favorite part of grad school was being able to do that. Um, I did not go to a small liberal arts college. I was not exposed to them at all um, throughout schooling. Um, and so learning about them was sort of like an aha moment for me that this was something that existed out there that I could do. Um, and I actually got the position through, um, it's called the Consortium for Faculty Diversity. And I know that they're gonna have the, the link for it. Um, but it was really great because I was able to sort of put my application out there to all of the liberal arts colleges that are involved in the consortium and then got the position from Amherst then. Um, and the tip I would have for someone who wants to work at a PUI is basically get as much teaching experience as you can um, and uh, know the current, really learn about pedagogy. That's super important. Like, Teaching a you know 500 person lecture might be great, but if you aren't able to talk about pedagogy, at least at the kinds of schools where I am, um, you aren't going to be able to get the position. Thank you, Diane. Uh, and then we'll hear from Dr. Priscilla Erickson. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Priscilla. Uh, I'm currently a postdoc at the University of Virginia, but I'm going to be starting a faculty position at the University of Richmond next year. So I'm kind of on this panel as someone who just went through the job search process. Um, I did go to a PUI. I went to Kenyon College, which is a tiny rural um, PUI in Ohio. 
Um, and that's what really made me want to be at a PUI. I had a really amazing experience there, especially doing undergraduate research. Um, and kind of by the end of my senior year, I just felt like my professors had like the best job in the world um, for a number of reasons that Terry mentioned. Um, it's kind of like being part of a close knit community um, that you're doing research, but not like constantly running on the grant treadmill. Um, and you could have like close relationships with students while they're in a very formative period of their life. And I'm still really close to several of my um, faculty members that I knew when I was in college. Um, so I like those long term relationships. Um, I was a research tech for a year and then went to grad school at uh, Berkeley. Um, and kind of echoing what Dan said, um, I, we didn't have to do a lot of teaching in my program, so I tried to really go out of my way to get more teaching experience, and I can talk a little bit about that when we um, get a little later in the conversation. Um, also, I'm half of a dual career couple, and my uh, partner and I kind of had to negotiate both of our careers, and so I can talk a little bit about that later if people are interested. Um, and I was a visiting faculty member for a year at University of Richmond before I got the job there. Um, and then my tip uh, is also um, to really seek out teaching experiences and training in pedagogy and teaching, uh, which is something I tried to do. Uh, but I think you can't totally sacrifice research either. Uh, to do that, you have to maintain um, excellence in research. And uh, a big part of being a faculty at a lot of PUIs is showing that you can do both really well. And so showing that during your training, I think, is important. Thank you so much, Priscilla. All right, and let's just dive right into our questions. So this first one, which Diane has volunteered to answer uh, or to speak to first, is what is a PUI? What makes it different from other institutions? Okay, um, so a, a PUI is um, uh, an institution that doesn't grant um, PhDs or very few. Um, so it's really geared towards undergraduate education. Um, it is not a they, they are not large research universities by any stretch of the imagination um, even though there is really great research happening in them um, and so the because of that um, you have to really work around how you do research and use undergraduates in your research um, and a big focus is on teaching thank you uh, and then Diane, or sorry, Priscilla or Terry, do you have anything else to add? Uh, yeah, yeah no, that was pretty good. Hmm? <laughs> All right. I'm good with that. <laughs> Thanks. All right, our next question, which uh, Priscilla volunteered to answer. Uh, what are some steps that we can take as PhD students and postdocs to prepare ourselves for this position and make ourselves an ideal applicant? Yeah, so um, some things that I did to prepare are um, I mentored a lot of undergraduates during my PhD. The lab I was in was very amenable to having a lot of undergraduates um, that could do semi-independent projects. And so I think I had like six or seven who I supervised during my PhD at various times. Um, I also, my PhD institution had a program where grad students could like teach their own class and it was just like a small one unit class that met once a week. Um, but my friend and I developed one of those and it was basically like a primary literature seminar where we kind of focused on one topic within genetics and uh, we had a wide variety of students who took it like some were like anthropology majors and some were going on to grad school in biology. Uh, but we taught that, but that was a really good, like, first independent teaching approach. And then I also tried to find um, opportunities to learn about pedagogy. So I took a class in the psychology department that was about the psychology of learning um, and how to design courses to maximize learning. And I also took another class that was specifically on mentoring, and it was kind of like a hands-on training where you had to have a student you were mentoring at the time and um, kind of like this guided mentorship class. Um, and then as a postdoc, um, last summer, I volunteered to teach a summer class, which was really good because I got like the full instructor of record experience, but it was compressed down into a month. So it didn't like completely kill my research time for a huge extended period of time. Um, and I think having that experience uh, was like very favorable when I was applying for jobs. 
Also, um, sorry, one other thing is like seeking out mentors who are supportive of your goals. Um, I think sometimes it can be intimidating to like tell a mentor like, oh, I actually don't want to go to an R1 institution because that's kind of like expected to be the main track of PhDs. But um, I've been really lucky that I had mentors who are like very supportive because um, this has been my goal all along. And I made that very clear even when I was applying for like postdoc fellowships and stuff. I said, this is what I want to do. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, and Diane or Terry, do you have anything to add to that? Um, I, I would echo a lot of what Priscilla said. Um, I made a lot of use of the Center for Teaching and Learning at my university when I was a graduate student. Um, they offered courses um, about you know, creating, creating classes, things like that. Um, I also attended, um, there's a summer institute for scientific teaching. Um, and so I went I did that. So basically every, every opportunity that I had to get pedagogical training, I took advantage of. Um, and even, even as, a, as a graduate student, um, there was an opportunity to basically be, um, give feedback to um, the, the teaching assistants, the graduate te te teaching assistants, and I was able to do that as well. So I had sort of all different levels of um, teaching experience sort of going into my first position. Yeah, I've you. got a couple thing, things to add. Uh, one is uh, just a small thing is that undergraduate co-authorship is golden um, when you're applying for positions. Saying that you mentored undergraduates, one thing is, but having them being an author on a paper, I mean, first author, oh wow, that would be amazing. But just to show that you had students work with you who earned authorship matters. Uh, the other thing while you're in grad school is if you know that you're looking for a job at a PUI, is be sure to establish your own intellectual uh, trajectory and your own identity independent of the lab that you're working in. Um, because uh, there's going to be concern by search committees that you're not going to be able to run your own research program independently of the lab that you came from. So you need, and so, and this is going to be particularly key because if your work equipment relies on million dollar equipment or access to some core facility that you might not have at the PUI, um, then they would be like, well, we don't want to hire this person if we know they can't be successful here. And so uh, what a lot of, the reason a lot of places are looking for at least one postdoc or some kind of postdoc experience um, is to show that a person can have a successful research program independent of the lab where they went to grad school. Um, and so, you know, because it's really hard to see if, you know, there's multiple authors on the papers that you had when you went to grad school. Well, how much of that was you being really successful on your own? Um, that's not necessarily required, but people are going to have to be convinced that this is, uh, that you are be able to run your own lab. Um, and so really a strong publication record is as or more important than for other jobs because we need to know that you can continue to do research and publish papers while maintaining a teaching load. Thanks so much. All right, and then following up on some of the things we talked about. Uh, so Terry, can you speak to how much experience, teaching experience does one need? Um, you need to, some people say you have to have been a, an instructor of record for a course. I don't think that's true, um, but that definitely, but you need to convince the search committee that you are serious about pedagogy and that you have some teaching experience and you have some idea what it's like because you want to hire someone, bring them in and f have them discover that they don't like teaching. And so one good way of doing that is showing that you have. Um, but otherwise, if you talk with sincerity, um, and with knowledge about uh, pedagogy and student development, what it means to, to be a, a teacher in higher ed. Uh, so I think your teaching statement is really important. Um, but again, having that experience uh, is also uh, assuages concerns. Um, you know, some places, because you basically have to show that you're solid at research and mentoring and that you're solid at teaching, and they both really matter. Thanks. Um, and then to follow, well, so sorry, Priscilla or Diane, do you have anything to add to that? And then you can also jump in because this, this uh, tags right on to what Terry just said. How important is the teaching versus research? 
Well, I was just going to add that I think the expectation for prior teaching varies a lot by school and even department. For example, my partner is in the chemistry department at University of Richmond, and he did not have any formal teaching experience other than like TAing in grad school when he got his position. Um, so, and uh, but in my department, I think it would be really unlikely that they would hire someone in that position. So. Um, it is variable. And so, I mean, you, if there's schools you can, are interested in, you can also like go and stalk people, <laughs> not stalk, but search people online and look at their records and see what kinds of experiences people have had. Uh, I'll just add that the culture, yeah, so the, this is an important point from Priscilla that I'd just like to expand on that. The culture of every department and every institution is really different. Um, and so even if you have two institutions that look really, really different on paper, let's say you compare like Kenyon and Oberlin or something like that, it could be that the culture about the priority of what the department is looking for and what they value is really different. Um, and so the rhetoric about research and teaching being important and how important teaching is is universal but really how do people feel about it and what do they really prioritize when they hire and make tenure decisions that's actually a really hard thing to get a read on until you've spent a lot of time in the department like I, there's professors who've been in a department for a year who really still don't understand like feelings in the department about how teaching and research should be balanced i want to sort of piggyback on what terry just said because um both of the institutions where I've worked, Amherst and Vassar, um, they're both considered sort of selective institutions, but the research expectation at Amherst is much, much higher than it is at Vassar. Um, and the, the sort of level of um, research output that is expected and um, grants that you get is also higher there than it is at Vassar. Um, with a corresponding similar teaching load. So even, like you said, even schools that look the same on paper um, can have really, really different expectations. Thank you so much. Um, so our next question, how can you distinguish yourself as someone who truly wants to work at a PUI during the application process? And Priscilla, can you speak to that? Um, yeah, so what I tried to do is um, be really like genuine in my statements and use personal stories and anecdotes. So I talked about my undergraduate experience at PUI and what it meant to me. And I talked about um, the experience of mentoring a really successful undergraduate who I had, who actually did get a first author paper out of her work um, in your teaching statement, giving examples of like specific activities that you did in your class and like what the outcomes of those activities or like how you saw that those improve student learning or um, examples of things you'll do to create a more inclusive environment. Um, if you've done them already, that's gonna be even better, but I think giving like uh, really clear examples that you've thought through what this career is gonna look like and how you aspire to excel at it um, is, that's what I tried to convey in my application materials. Thank you. And Diane, do you have anything to add? I do. Um, mostly, mostly because like we're we're currently going through like hiring and stuff. So I've I've, I've been seeing what what we're looking for. Um, and one of the biggest ones is that if you're if you're going, you can't use the same application for a PUI that you used for a that you're sending to an R1. Um, if your um, research statement and your cover letter are talking about all of the research that you want to do and um, how you're going to have, you know, how like your, your funding, it's going to require like postdocs and things like that. Um, they're really going to question whether or not you understand what it means to work at a PUI. Um, and it's really obvious as, as you read applications, um, whether or not the person is just applying for jobs or if they've really thought about um, this as a goal. Because, um, so the, the, the application has to be tailored, not just to working at a PUI, but to that school. Um, so you need to look at what the um, priorities are of that school, really research it and research the department and understand how you can fit into that department, what you will add to it, um, what classes you would likely teach at that school, where you think that you could it, you know, improve the curriculum, that kind of thing. Um, and that will make you 
you know, it, it will make it obvious that you have, you are applying to that school for a reason other than it's an available job. Thank you. Uh, Terry, uh, do you have anything to add? Yeah, just say, it's like, uh, as you discuss things um, th that uh, you are student-centered, so that when you're identifying why you'd be teaching a certain way, why you'd be having a certain research project, um, you know, then, then is, the, is the welfare and professional development of the students at the center of your motivation and um, for both, for all of your statements and, and when you're talking. And I think that's one way that people can suss. It's like, well, why do they really want this job? Thank you so much. Um, so, uh, Diane, this question is for you. Is, do you have, so you've touched on it a little bit, but is there, do you have any information on teaching position at a PUI that doesn't involve running a research lab? Yeah, um, so different schools um, obviously have different positions, but um, there are oftentimes what they call like teaching professors or lecturer positions um, that don't have a research lab, don't have research funding, um, but teach at the school, um, are often involved in curriculum development, still mentor and advise students. Um, and it's, at least at my school, um, it's not necessarily that you can't do research, but you aren't given a dedicated research lab. Um, so we have lecturers at, my, at Vassar who still mentor students, whose students still do research projects, but they just use um, other space. Um, but it, it and it's there's no research um, expectation for those positions. It's still, you're still allowed to do it, but there's no expectation and there's no funding for it. Thank you. And Priscilla or Terry, do you have anything to add to that? All right, so our next Oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I, I was just going to add that at University of Richmond, there are people who have those positions and they actually are sometimes able to acquire small bits of money. So I know someone who has a full time, like she teaches a four four course load, so four classes each semester, but she's able to get like little pockets of money and she actually does mentor several research students at any given time. So um, there's also like creative ways to still do research, even if you do wind up in a position like that. Um, Thank you so that's, much. One thing is, if you if you are looking for a tenure track position at a PUI, but you're not into research, then I would suggest that actually this really isn't the job for you, um, because um, we're here. If you, uh, you don't necessarily need to have ambitions to publish a lot, but you need to want to be able to do research with students and get papers out once in a while and help them get into grad school and stuff like that. That's really what we're about. Thanks so much. That was really good to to hear about. Um, so then, uh, this, this can be for anybody, what's your average weekly um, split between research and teaching? Okay, I'll take that. See everyone's thinking. <laughs> um, so, um, so, so right now I'm reassigned, all of my teaching is reassigned to admin stuff, so that's weird. But I remember the way it was like. Um, I sometimes get in more time for research than you can imagine. Um, my department actually had a 4-4 based teaching load, which is almost as high as it gets outside community colleges. And so I never actually really taught the 4-4 because I bought my time out with grants. But still, I would spend the bulk of my time on teaching. Um, but that said, I don't think it's that different from faculty or research institutions if you actually look at their time budgets. There's studies in the Higher Education Research Consortium, the HERC studies. And, and if you look at time budgets, um, we spend most of our time like in meetings, really. Um, and the, the difference is the reason that we're less productive in terms of the sheer numbers of papers and people at our ones isn't that we have less time for research, it's that we don't have a small army of grad students and, and postdocs who can write manuscripts. So those 20% tw of our time might be spent on research. It's just that we also have to write the manuscripts in that 20% of the time too. I would say that my time is probably about, um, 60% teaching, 30% research, and 10% service. Um, there is a decent amount of time to, to like he said, meetings, um, department meetings, faculty meetings, um, advising students, just meeting with students. Um, at PUIs, uh, at, at least at the ones I've been at, the, the students really understand that you are there for their, as, as a service to them, and so they make 
really good use of your time. Um, and I, at my, both of the schools that, where I worked, um, my teaching load has been um, two, two. So I've, and the labs count as one. So I'm like next semester, I'm teaching one course with a lab. Um, so the, the teaching loads definitely vary by institution. Yeah, and I'll just add that I've kind of gotten the impression that the amount of time you spend on teaching maybe somewhat decreases over time. Like the first few times you take teach a class, it's a lot more work um, and a lot more investment. But once you kind of get your rhythm and you get your syllabus figured out, like you're always constantly improving, but it just gets easier over time. And so I think people in their like third and fourth year have a lot more time for research than they did in their first or second year. Um, and, uh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, so one thing I like to add about like so actually so so P, if you were to separate pay UIs into categories like two major categories there's the slacks and then you have your regional private regional public universities and the regional publics are really different in how you manage your time and that there's a really a lot of flexibility in how you split your time where I spend plenty of time on research um, and service and not that much time on teaching now and everyone's fine with that um, whereas like so I could buy down my four four to a zero zero and no one minds but if I were teaching at the slack next door at Occidental or something like that it would be a politically challenging problem for me to get out of teaching the class that they hired me to teach we hired you to teach entomology how come you're not teaching entomology um, whereas um, at a regional uh, public university, you, you can really choose how you want to build your career in one direction or the other. So the teacher scholar model where you're expected to be there for the students all the time and do research and teaching is the model for slacks, right? Whereas um, in regional, which, and if that's what you'd like, that's great. I mean, you can do that at a regional public too, but if you wanted to go more admin or really focus on teaching or really focus on research, then you have the latitude within the institution to support that. Thanks. And could you brief someone, um, sorry, uh, could one of our panelists brief, briefly define um, what is this 224410? <laughs> it's, I can, I can. It's the, the amount of courses or credit units, whatever that you're teaching in a semester. Um, so if it's 2 2, you're teaching two, two classes each semester or four classes each semester, et cetera. Um, at, at Vassar and Amherst, they have what's what's like a two two plus one um, is is how they they refer to it, where it's two courses um, where the labs actually count as a, an extra course, um, and then the plus one is taken up by um, like you can fulfill that with like doing an intensive course that like teaches like at, at sort of at a small level, really um, like maybe four students. Or you can fill that with um, mentoring research students in your lab. Thank you. And then um, uh, this is a term Terry used. What is buying down your course load? Um, well, so uh, uh, if let's say you know your your, your job there is in part to teach, and so. Uh, if you're not going to teach that class, then they need to have someone else teach that class on your behalf. And so then you need to use funding, either internal or external funding, that basically would pay for that reassigned time for the adjunct. So, so it turns out that in, in my system, if I use internal funding within the CSU, for six grand, um, I could buy up three units or like one lecture course, essentially. Although from an NSF grant, they would be buying me out at like uh, one frac, like one ninth of my salary, essentially. Um, and so you can use, so if you have a grant, as long as you have permission from your chair and or dean or whoever, then you can use that grant money to buy your teaching time down. Um, you also could potentially negotiate that as well. Thank you. And then so a um, little bit more about t uh, your teaching content. Do you let your research and lab work uh, inspire what you teach about? Does that end up in your, in your course um, syllabus? Um, oh yeah, I think this is mine. Um, so I, I know for 
my job next year, I am expected to develop a lab class that will integrate my research into that lab so that the students are doing like novel research. Like it's going to be a genetics lab. And so we're not going to like cross flies and map mutation. That's like not novel research. Everyone knows where that mutation is already. Um, so I need to figure out a way, which I'm still thinking about, of how to integrate my research so that um, students can actually participate it in a lab format. So in that way, my lab will definitely or my research will definitely inform my teaching, but, um, and then also like when I develop an upper level class, I will probably selfishly do it around topics that I'm interested in and are relevant to my research. Um, but then for other classes, like when I teach the intro classes, that's more of like a set curriculum. And so uh, my research doesn't really connect to DNA repair. So I'm not gonna be talking about my research so often in that. Thank you. And Diane or Terry, do you have anything to add to that? Um, I mean, my my research ties in where it, it fits. Um, so I'm a plant physiologist. Um, and one of the things that I talked about when I was applying was how the methods that I use and the equipment that I use could actually be integrated into um, the plant physiology curriculum. Um, and so it, it's sort of I think it probably made sort of the the idea of purchasing this large this expensive piece of equipment um, that would be for my research use make it a little bit more attractive because they could also implement it into courses and so I kind of sold it that way in that um, it could be used in the plant physiology course if the botany course wanted to use it they could um, we figured out ways that it could be used in even the introductory labs just so that the students could sort of see the kinds of equipment that research is done on and you know get to to touch them and, and see things that they could do in real time very cool thank you um, and then terry you have anything to add all right wonderful so uh, as uh, our panelists have mentioned you do still have to apply for funding for your research so how does funding priscilla i think you volunteered to answer this uh how does funding for projects work yeah, so um, part of my hire included a startup package where I got to make a list of everything I need to get a lab going um, for like supplies, reagents, all of that. Um, and I gave it to the dean and then they, um, they basically approved everything I asked for. So I asked other people at the school to see their startup list to get kind of like a ballpark amount of like what is reasonable to ask for because you don't want to be like two times that and like sound outrageous. So I tried to hit kind of at the high end of the range that I had seen there. Um, and so that is expect that's enough money to get me through several years. Um, and then I'm definitely expected to apply for grants. Um, I don't think at University of Richmond, at least in my department, that actually getting a grant is required for tenure, but you're definitely expected to try. Um, and so there are kind of like smaller, there's some like small grant programs that are designed specifically for PUIs. There's one that's only in Virginia that a lot of people get that's like a nice chunk of money. Uh, but then there's also funding mechanisms like the um, NIH R15 grants, which are like $300,000 over three years, and the NSF um, RUI grants, which are, I think, a similar amount of money. Um, and so those are some of the mechanisms that people might use. Um, University of Richmond also is just like kind of a crazy rich PUI. And so they kind of give people a lot of money like, oh, if you mentor three students this summer, we'll give you $5,000 and stuff. So there's other like pockets of money that you can get, like even if you don't have a grant to have enough money to like buy your tack or whatever you need to keep things going. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, Diane or Terry, do you have anything to add to that? Um, I also really similarly um, had, had a startup um and my department actually really worked with me once once they had offered me the position um they collected like they gave me the um startup requests from the most recent hires um and basically to, to sort of base my range around so i didn't even have to ask for them um and i have three years from my start date to spend my startup basically there is no expectation of getting outside funding um there is an expectation for research so if i need it to 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 do my research then i need to get it but they're not my, my tenure is absolutely not based on getting grants um and 
I can't remember what the rest of the question was, but yeah, that's, that's basically it is that, yeah, it's, it's definitely not, not something that's, that's required. And it's, it's one of the selling points that even my colleagues talk about is that it's really nice. Like once, once they've gotten tenure, they're like, it's really nice to not have to worry about getting grants right now. So especially right now. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah. So we have, um, uh, yeah, so you're expected to apply for grants, but if you don't get the grant, that doesn't mean that you uh, lose your job for the most part. Um, it's more like as long as you have papers come out once in a while and that you're working with students um, and, of course, that you're teaching strong. Um, and so I think there's clearly an expectation that you're seeking external funding and sincerity. Um, but um, and, and that increases the number of opportunities that you can often provide to students. But if the grant doesn't come in, usually at most places, then that's, that's not a deal breaker. Thank you. And then I guess to follow up on this, Terry, since you've mentioned a couple times, uh, how much emphasis is put on publishing at PUIs? Uh, and then what, uh, on, to piggyback on that, what types of research questions get funded for PUIs? Um, it, it really varies from institution to institution. Um, at my institution, the bar for tenure is a paper. I'm not kidding. Like one paper published since you've been hired. Or no, no, it's two. Now it's raised to two, um, which is eminently doable, um, I would think, I would hope. E even if you're teaching like a, you know, in the first year, your first two years, you're teaching a 3-3. Three, three, um, and you could probably get a couple of papers out in that time zone, I would think. And so um, other, like, the higher the endowment of the institution, then the lower the teaching load, which also means the higher the research expectations. Um, when I was at the University of San Diego, that bar was also, was one paper, oddly enough. Um, and so, um, and I don't know if it's increased now or not, but... Um, but the other institutions have much higher scholarship expectations, especially the more uh, prestigious wealthy slacks, I can imagine, like Amherst again, right? I'm sure they expect plenty of more papers and they might prescribe what journals. On our part, in our kind of institution, what we just want to see is that people are doing work, getting it done and giving students great opportunities. Um, I think you'll, uh, your professional success is considered to be greater if you, uh, uh, you know, publish more and publish better. But um, I think people just want to see you doing research. But it, it's, uh, but again, that varies highly from the culture from one institution to the next. And the way you can judge that is you look at, look at the Google Scholar pages of all the faculty who are currently in the institution who have been recent hires and see what they're doing. And that's basically the expectation for you. That said, our bar for tenure is a couple papers, but that said, almost every, everyone in my department is way clearing that bar. Um, but that's because we hired people and are who are uh, and we're supporting them, and and so they're successful because we're supporting them. Um, but it's not like we would deny them tenure if they had trouble getting papers out. Thank you. And Priscilla or Diane, do you have anything to add to that about how it works at your institutions? Um. So for for mine, um, at the basically for my, my, my three year review, um, I am, I am newly in my position. I, I'm in my second year. Um, it's based, my, my tenure is based completely on teaching. There is like research isn't even considered for that one. Um, but for going up for actual tenure, um, basically I'm the, the expectation at Vassar is exceptional um, in either research or teaching and um, I can't even remember the word that they use for it, but basically high in, in the other or exceptional in both. So you have to have basically be rated exceptional in one or the other or both, and then be, be highly rated for the other one. Um, so it, you can be, if, if you are considered a, 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 a wonderful teacher and you may have only gotten like one publication, like Terry said, um, you will probably get tenure. However, um, if you're only okay in both, you're probably not going to get tenure. And that is definitely different at Amherst than it is at Vassar in that Amherst has, like, like Terry was saying, um, you, it's high, like it's going to be exceptional in both. Um, and their, their version of exceptional in research is going to be lots of publications and probably in higher journals. Whereas at Vassar, I can, they, they would actually count, um, applying for a grant as scholarly output. 
um, and getting students, ha having students present posters at um, research, um, at like conferences is considered scholarly output. So all of those things are considered. Thank you so much. Um, Scylla, do you have anything to add? Right, Sorry, I've been catching up on questions in the chat. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's all, it's all good. All right. Um, so uh, I guess what are some of the ch challenges that have been unique to the experience of being to a um, of being at a PUI? Sorry, um, and that is open to anybody. I'm sorry, I was busy in the chat box. Oh, it's okay. Um, what are what have been some of the challenges unique to the experience of being at a PUI? Okay. Um, uh, for me, it, it's it's not like I'm I'm driven by like people holding me in high esteem, but I have to say it's really really hard when people discount um, you and your work just based on the identity of the institution that you work at. Um, like if you're working at um, you know a, a large research institution, you go to a conference, people automatically look your name tag. Go oh. Um, but if, you know, if I'm working at a low prestige institution like Cal State Dominguez Hills, people will assume that I'm not as good simply based on the institution that I'm hired at. And there's a lot of people, even though some people might be working at a prestigious slack, but, but they might not realize it's actually a prestigious slack and get that same kind of treatment. Um, and so if you're trying, if you want to be famous for being a scientist, then this is not the place to work. Um, because you're, you can't become famous as a scientist. Like if I wanted fame in science, I'd have to take a job at like, you know, USC or Caltech or UCLA because that fame is associated in part with the institution you're at. Um, I'm happy with what I'm doing, but it, if that's your ambition, then this is the wrong place. And it's sometimes, it's, and, and it still sometimes uh, it, it hurts the ego to see people like think of you as less important. If I can pick, I'm going to kind of piggyback on what Terry was saying. Um, for me, one of the uh, drawbacks is that, at least at, at a small liberal arts college, um, your, all of your peers are, are, are basically going to decide who gets tenure, and that's not just your department. It's also the people in the humanities and social sciences. And if you are in English, say, um, your work is considered like the same as if you were at an R1. Like they publish in the same journals, everything like that. They don't necessarily understand that it doesn't work differently for the sciences. Um, and so they're like, why, why haven't you published more? Why haven't you written books? And it's like, they, it, it's a different kind of thing. Um, the other thing is that you have to get um, outside reviewers of your tenure package that are within your field, but don't have any, connection to you necessarily. Um, so it can't be a previous um, supervisor or um, like it can't be your grad school PI or someone you worked with on a postdoc or that you have maybe even had a paper with. Um, and so doing enough research so that you are still relevant in your field so that someone can speak to, to how relevant your research is in the field um, and say whether or not you are producing good enough research output to to get that is difficult because the people who are giving their review of you might not really understand how research works at a PUI and they might not know your work because you're doing work at a PUI so it's a little bit of both of those and then um, that that kind of catch 22 with with the the humanities um, needing to to sort of approve your tenure or not um, so it, it really depends a lot on your department um, being fully supportive of you and getting pretty decent um, outside reviewers. Thank you. Um, and then, so moving on to the next question, what does diversity, inclusion, and retention look like at a PUI? Um. I can say University of Richmond has like a huge push for diversity and inclusion right now. And so I was saying this in the chat, but um, inclusive teaching is like absolutely hands down expected. Like I was asked about it in my interview. Um, so being like up on um, kind of that whole field of inclusive pedagogy is super, super important. 
Um, I know University of Richmond is also making a big push to diversify their faculty. Um, and so like really actively seeking out um, faculty from underrepresented backgrounds. Um, I think the retention becomes a little more complicated and that is kind of like another thing they're working on that I don't know as much about. Um, but from a new faculty perspective, definitely like knowing and acting upon um, inclusive pedagogy is really important. Thank you. And Diane or Terry, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, the one thing I'll say is like, again, this is the thing I think that's very institution specific. And so I think it's the same kind of issues that we'd have in other places. Um, but as Priscilla pointed out, it plays out uh, just as well heavily in your teaching because that's the focus of the institution. Thank you. Um, and then, so this is uh, a question from our chat. What do undergrads get paid for the research um, or do they primarily work for class credit? Um, I will say that that depends on on the school. Um, when when I was at Amherst, the student there was money to pay students. Um, at Vassar, there is not, um, and so students do research for credit. Um, so it's it, a big part of that is just depends on how rich your school is. Thank you. And yeah, yeah go ahead. Uh, 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 I would say that also. Um, in our department, there's because uh, most of our students are uh, low income, there's strong pressure to not like work students for to you. We could, in theory, engage students and give them credit for their work and have them basically pay tuition dollars for credit. But we try not to do that too much because essentially that's thought of as a, an exploitative labor practice. Um, uh, we have a lot of students who also are working like 20, 30 hours a week while going to school. And so um, so we try to give them some research experiences in our lab on a small scale to give them experience. Then hopefully we can find the grant funding so that instead of them like, you know, driving an Uber or waiting tables or washing dishes, that they would be able to work in our labs. Um, and so there's pressure on us to bring in enough grant money to hire students to do that. Um, there also is some work study funding and internal funding for students. Uh, it's, but Essentially, it varies, but if you have the money to pay students, you can. Um, but it's plenty, there are plenty of students who are willing often to do this uh, for credit. Thank you so much. So this brings us to 150, and I think we're going to have some time after um, to, to, to keep talking to our panelists. But I just wanted to, um, in case anyone has to go, I just want to share some, some parting uh, some parting comments uh, and the survey. So um, thank you to our panelists for your insightful comments. We enjoyed hearing about your journey and experience at the PUI today. And then thank you for our audience. We've had some great discussion questions and everyone has been extremely respectful. Uh, so also, um, as I just mentioned, Molly is dropping a link to an exit survey on today's workshop Wednesday in the chat box. If you fill it out, you have a chance to win Terry McGlynn's new book, The Chicago Guide to College Science Teaching. Yay. So fill it out um, and then we'll contact the winners by email. Um, second, we have a couple of scheduled workshop Wednesdays coming up, and as you can see on the slide here. Uh, so stay tuned for more information. And in the survey, you can even uh, lend your input into what you'd like to hear about in future workshop Wednesdays. So if you registered for this event, you will receive a resource packet and a link to the recording of today's presentation. Uh, and the recording will be made public on YouTube in a few weeks. Uh, finally, uh, if you're interested in participating in GSA's Early Career Leadership Program and being responsible for putting together programming like what you saw today, um, applications are open until November 30th. And again, Molly has put a link in the chat box. All right, so thank you so much. Uh, we still have some time to answer some more questions, so we can just keep going from there. Uh, so I guess jumping in, we haven't talked um, about exactly the lab running part yet. So uh, Priscilla, so what do some of your research uh, capacities look like? 
Um, so I am getting like a, it's about a 20 by 30 foot research lab that will be my space. And actually because of how it worked out, they're going to be renovating a space for me. So I actually get to pick how it's going to look in terms of like the benches and stuff, which will be kind of nice to get like a designer lab. Um, but uh, so, and then my startup will purchase a lot of equipment that goes in there, but there's also a lot of shared equipment that is, um, sponsored or like maintained by the university. So there's a small microscopy facility where they have like a confocal and an SEM and, um, some other things. Um, there's not, I do genomics. There's not really any on-site sequencing things. So my sequencing work will probably have to be outsourced, but I do have money set aside in my startup to do those sorts of things. Um, and I saw there was a question in the chat about students working in the summer. Um, I think in general, I'm expected to have students work with me in the summer. I think sometimes people might take a summer off to do something else, but in general, I'll have like multiple students working full time in the summer and then some students working um, either for credit or work study uh, during the semester. Thank you. Um, Diane or Terry, do you have anything to add to that? Um, mine's pretty similar to Priscilla, where um, my startup purchased the equipment that I needed that they didn't have. Um, but there was a lot of equipment sort of on site already that um, when I was planning my startup budget, basically, um, I had listed things and the, the chair was like, oh, we have one of those, so we can take that off. We have one of those, you know, you could use this. Um, and it let me add other things in that I wasn't asking for. Um, and in terms, I'm going to also touch on the, the summer students. Um, mine's a residential college, so everybody lives on campus. Um, and the only way that students can work during the summer is if they are specifically in a summer research program. Because um, otherwise there is not housing for them and we are not allowed to have them on campus if they're not in that program. Thank you. Um, and so, uh, Terry, how would you describe the work-life balance as a faculty member at a PUI uh, compared to an R1 institution? Oh, um, again, I think it, it depends really on the culture of the place. Um, the place where I'm at now, I think uh, we work really, really hard to have a good work-life balance where we uh, we show up at work at certain hours or we're working in particular hours and then we tried as much not to do, you know, research and grading at other times. But, um, uh, but I think that's sort of an individual choice. What, what one thing I like about where I'm at is that there's no pressure to be on campus at any particular time. If I'm, if I'm meeting with students for my office hours and I attend and I'm showing up at class and meeting all my obligations, there's no judgment about like, well, why weren't you on campus? Like your door was closed. Whereas there are some places where FaceTime is at a premium where you're basically expected to be there in mind to five, Monday through Friday. And if someone's, if a student strolls by your office and you're never there, that's like an issue. There's this level of student of entitlement, but that varies with the kind of institution that you're at. Um, and so I know, uh, like in Slacks, the idea is that, you know, to some extent your life is the work and that your identity as a professor at that institution, you know, you know, you're on for the students when you're there the whole time, I, although you could check out when you're off campus, you know, um, whereas I think, um, in like the more regional public university situation, it's like, as long as you're meeting your obligations, then people are fine with you. There's no expectation for additional face time. You can take 24 hours or eight hours to respond to an email and you're not going to get any guff. Thank you. Um, Priscilla or Diane, do you have anything to add to that? Thank you. All right. So our next question, um, it's kind of a, a big <laughs> chunky one. Um, so prior to your current position, so how did you work to develop a study system that would be tractable at a PUI? And then how are you going up? How do you go about setting those goals um, and achieving them as a new faculty? It's like, how'd you develop the research program you were you wanted to do at the PUI? And then how'd you go about implementing it? Do you, can I talk or did you call someone? Sorry. Okay, I can talk about this because I'm kind of in the middle of doing this. Um, I did my 
um, PhD in fish. And I kind of decided at that time that I did not want to be responsible for maintaining a vertebrate colony on my own, especially at a PUI where you are unlikely to consistently have the funding to have like a full time tech to help with that. And I just, after seeing what my PI went through, I just did not want to like spend every Christmas and New Year's and Thanksgiving and Easter feeding the fish. Um, so I actively decided not to stay with fish, even though I really love fish. Um, and so I went to an invertebrate lab. I did Drosophila melanogaster for my postdoc, but during my postdoc, I felt like, oh man, Drosophila melanogaster, especially in the evolutionary genetics field, is a crowded field. Things move fast, and research at PUIs is not going to move fast. So I do not want to stay in Drosophila melanogaster um, because I feel like I can't keep up at the pace that research is going to go. So I, in the last like six months or so, have been developing another system, which is an invasive species of fruit fly that not very many people are working on. And I think it's super interesting. There's kind of some cool like natural history behind it and also the whole invasive species aspect. Um, so I have tried to do that. I will say I applied for jobs um, in a prior application cycle and I had a to totally different idea for a different insect that I wanted to work on. And I was told, uh, we don't believe that you can actually do that. It's too different from what you've done. So that's why I kind of restructured and decided to focus on this invasive fruit fly species because it's close enough to Drosophila melanogaster that people believe I can do it, um, but it kind of is carving out my own role. Thank you so much. And Diane or Terry, do you have anything to add to that? Um, one of the things that I did when I was sort of deciding on how to structure my research was um, I again, thought about the priorities at the school. Um, and at Vassar, there is a, a really a strong push towards environmental science. Um, and so when I was planning my research, I, I thought about things that could address um, the student's interest in environmental science and also using um, the, we have a, a wildlife preserve on campus and we have a farm on campus. Um, so thinking about things that students could do using the um, using those resources specifically. Um, and one thing that's that's kind of great is that like once basically once people get tenure, they they kind of just study whatever they want. So and and a lot of the research is not necessarily um, what like my goals are like I have my lab goals, but students come in and they're like, I'm really interested in this other thing. Can you mentor my project? And students get money for um, like senior theses. And so if, if I feel like it's something I can mentor, I'm like, yeah, sure, let's go, you can go ahead and do that. Um, and so it kind of takes you on these sort of wild tangents of, of things that are sort of related to your research, but not necessarily. Um, so it's, it's, it's kind of, I don't know, it's kind of a wild ride in that you're not necessarily focused on one specific thing. Well, maybe like I am, but my lab is not. Awesome. Uh, so I am actually going to take over moderating uh, the second segment, which is kind of our bonus round, maybe consider it office hours after the class that we've just had. Um, so I'm gonna continue asking questions, but again, we respect your time and if you have to leave, please do. We've just been getting a lot of really awesome questions in the chat and have had a lot of great questions throughout uh, the registration process. So our wonderful panelists have agreed to stay on for a little bit more time. Um, so I'm going to move forward. Um, speaking kind of to fill that gap between a PUI and an R1 institution, have you all been able to collaborate with R1 institutions that are perhaps geographically um, near you? Um, and is, is that sort of collaboration valued by your department? Um, there, I, I have not yet. I probably will collaborate with my postdoc lab just because it's like 70 miles down the road and the, there's ways that we can collaborate, but it's also important to kind of like strike out your own research record. So I'm going to be careful about how much I do that. Like, I don't want it to look like I'm just tacking things on to my postdoc lab. Um, but there are people in my department. So um, VCU is in Richmond and there are people who have collaborations going at VCU. Um, so I would say it's definitely not expected, but if, if you can do it and it's making a contribution to your research and specifically if it can involve undergraduates, then that's, it's 
good and fine. But it's also important to show that you are doing your own thing and making your own intellectual con contributions and that the students you're working with are making contributions. Um, I will add that yeah, coll collaborations are a great way to get funding. Um, there is funding, especially in the NSF, that is specifically set aside for PUIs. Um, and there is funding, I, I don't remember the numbers, Terry probably knows them, but ones that are um, in collaboration with like larger grants. So they're like kind of like add-ons onto grants. Um, and spoke recently to an NSF um, program director, and they were saying that they're almost always funded. Um, so it's it's one of those things where it's 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 a beneficial relationship for both the um, R1 and the PUI because the R1 gets to basically say that they've broadened their impacts by bringing in these like undergrads, um, and then for the PUI it has the the obvious benefit of sort of adding in this this larger research subject and getting to contribute into these maybe larger papers um, and even possibly getting their students to work in larger labs. Um, yeah, I think uh, as Priscilla has, was saying, and, and what Diane was saying too, that uh, you want to make sure that you have your own intellectual identity. And so if you're collaborating, and if it's a genuine collaboration with an R1 lab, that's great. I've seen sometimes at, with different people, like they're, they're, the lab that they came from, either as a grad student or as a postdoc, um, the PI in that lab sometimes want to work with them as if there's like a little mini satellite of their lab rather than like a true like equal collaboration. Um, and so I collaborate with people in R1s in all different places, not necessarily geographically near, um, and that works out for me just fine. Um, but I work with people who view me as an equal partner. Um, that said, it's a really good opportunity for students to have exposure to research institutions. Um, when, especially for, for our students, if they're applying to grad school, having that exposure to hang out with PhD students and postdocs really, really uh, changes their professional trajectory. But then again, our students are underrepresented when they end up going to graduate school, as opposed to small liberal arts colleges, which you know disproportionately send students to graduate school. Um, and so, so that's a real uh, distinction there. All right, thank you. Um, a question that we uh, touched on in the beginning uh, when Priscilla was introducing herself was this two-body problem of having uh, a partner that is also in academia. Um, so if uh, I, any of you could speak to this two-body problem and then also more generally, how much did you have to move around during this job search? Obviously, a lot of you um, had VAP positions. Um, so yeah, just speak about this um, uh, moving around a lot. <laughs> Um, I can talk about that. Um, so my, we, I came to Virginia because my partner got a tenure track position here. Um, it, to be totally honest, Virginia was not my first choice for a postdoc location, but the um, advice that I got from a valued mentor who had also negotiated two body position is that you kind of sometimes have to take turns and sometimes maybe one person's career has to take priority and then in a couple of years you reevaluate and see if it's working for both people and if not maybe you have to reconsider and so that's sort of what we did um, we came to Virginia for his job I did my postdoc um, and then we decided that we would go on the job market together and so we tried to apply um, for we tried to seek out places where there were positions open that we were both able to apply and so that really limits where you're applying um, there were some places like the LA area there happened to be a lot of jobs open last year so we both applied to jobs in LA we both applied to jobs in Philadelphia there were a few other places um, we also like my partner applied for some jobs where I didn't have something just to try to get some leverage. So we were hoping that if he had an offer somewhere else and was like, I'm going to leave unless my partner can get a job here. Like we played that game a little bit too. I don't know how much that actually worked out, but in the end it worked out. Um, it happened to be that University of Richmond had a position open that was like perfectly cut out for what I do. Um, and so I applied for that. Um, and I was in this visiting position there, they had actually asked me to take this visiting position. They needed someone to teach and they knew I was in the area and had the expertise to do it. So um, taking that visiting position is probably the reason I got the job there because they were able to see me as a teacher and see that I 
um, like really cared about teaching and I tried really hard and my students in general liked me, I think. And so that was good. I, I was really, it was a big decision for me to take that visiting position. Um, I was really worried about putting research on the side for a year um, and how that would help me and other job prospects. But in the end, like, even though taking the visiting position, like, wasn't necessarily my first choice of what to do for that year, that actually worked out and kind of was the foot in the door. Um, so we fortunately didn't have to move around a lot, but we did have a very stressful year last year where we were both flying like all over the place to interview for jobs. And um, yeah, it was a very tense year, but it worked out. <laughs> um, Diane or Terry, do you have anything to, to say about moving around, multiple body problems, et cetera? Um. Yeah, it's hard. And so my, my spouse is not uh, an academic, but has a career, which as as important as mine and also is equally difficult to move. Um, and so uh, when, uh, so one of the reasons I ended up taking the visiting assistant professor position where I did is that was a place where she, uh, for her to go to graduate school at a program that was excellent for her. Um, and then we're really geographically limited thinking about the range of places um, where we could apply for jobs where essentially she needed to work in a large city. Um, and then um, 12 years ago, uh, when I was denied tenure, it's like, holy crap, we need to move. Um, but her career was on a particular path. And so how are we going to do that? That's a really hard thing to, um, we ended up finding places that were positive moves for both of us, actually. Um, and I think a lot of this, when you talk to people who solve these two career problems, there's a lot of luck involved and people just as often solve them by having someone working at a neighboring institution rather than the same place. Cause it's really, really hard um, to uh, get that happening um, in the same institution. Cause you know, what, someone has to be a rock star for an institution to hire two people uh, for the most part, uh, or if the school has a lot of money and it's geographically challenged, then they try to, then they know they can get like two people when it's hard to keep them. Um, but uh, yeah, and I think everyone finds their own solution to the dual career pathway. Um, but I mean, I've never talked to anyone who said that they didn't feel lucky. I think luck is a huge piece. I'll just add that getting two positions at the same school seems to be extremely rare at PUIs from everyone I know who's been this, like done this. Um, my partner is very good at what he does and was a very strong applicant when he applied to jobs last year. He got I don't even know how many offers he got. He got a lot and every single offer he would say, I have a partner who's a biologist, send them my CV, everything. And every single school said, we're really sorry. We just can't create a position out of thin air. Um, bigger schools can do that a lot of times, um, like larger departments, but uh, the budgets are very like predefined at PUIs. And so just creating a second position like on short notice is pretty unusual unless there's like really exceptional circumstances. Um, but yeah, a lot of luck. I know I, the couples who I know who have had it figured out, like one couple, like there just happened to be two positions in the same department that were like perfectly described, the two of them, and they applied and the department didn't even realize that they were married and they got the jobs like independently of one another. So just like totally crazy. <laughs> but. Um, awesome. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I and, add one more quick Yeah, go actually. ahead. Yeah. So another thing, because I based on what uh, a comment, it's like, I know someone who's a professor, that's someone who's a grants administrator. I think it is a common thing for someone to have an, uh, a job at the same institution, but not as a faculty member, but in some other kind of staff or supporting role, which might even involve academic and research, but you're not a faculty member. So the dual career faculty hire is hard, but I think I know many couples where one of them is a grants administrator, actually. That's, that's a thing I've seen in a recurring basis. Excellent. Yeah, thank you for all that insight. Um, so as we're talking about these uh, applying for a position, um, what is the best way to look for vacancies at PUIs? Someone in the chat said that a quick search on the most popular websites like Indeed or Glassdoor don't pull up a lot of options. Um, I signed up for alerts from um, HERC, Higher Ed Research Consortium? I don't know what it stands for. Um, so I signed up for alerts from them. Um, yeah, hercjobs.org, that's it. Um, and basically just sort of set my, my you know, keywords, whatever, and they just sent them to me. Um, 
but I also specifically looked like I identified schools um, that were in places that I wanted to work um, and just checked them all of the time. Um, yeah, so it I I definitely lucked out with with my positions. I've, I'm I, I am kind of a unicorn in in my position in that I didn't I didn't do a lot of applications. I didn't do um, a lot. I didn't search for a very long time. I moved directly into a VAP um, and then to my my current position. So it's it just it just all of the all the stars aligned and sometimes that just happens. There are also some like kind of open source Google Docs spreadsheets that document different jobs. So I used um, one called ecoevojobs.net um, and there's a lot of genetics positions that go on there. I would say not every position that a geneticist would be eligible for goes on there. I was actually thinking maybe that's something cool that GSA could do is start a, a job Google Docs specifically for genetics positions because you get tons of inside information like you will often see like if a job has sent out phone interview invitations or whatever and you know if you didn't get it then maybe you're not in the running for that job anymore uh, but it's also just a good compiled resource so um, and there's there are some for other fields I don't know what all of them are. Um, I would just like to add that I think uh, almost every faculty job if it's a real search is going to be in the Chronicle of Higher Education. So just set up, search the Chronicle, look at the Chronicle every time. Once in a while, some institutions might not advertise a job there. But um, when I was looking for a job, now granted, this was like 12 years ago, I applied to 80 something positions and almost all of them were in the Chronicle. I found a few others that didn't manage to be there. Uh, but uh, that's, I, I, that's, I think, you're, uh, almost a one stop shop in addition to all the other options that people have said. Awesome, thank you. Um, so kind of relating to a, to a, a workshop Wednesday we had previously um, two months ago, how open are PUIs in general to hiring non-US citizens? Uh, for us, it's a non-issue. Um, if someone, if we wanna hire someone, then, um, then we'll sponsor them for a visa. And, and our institution has new issue sponsoring. It's so like the only challenge is at the interview stage, if you happen to be on the other side of the planet, then, uh, then it'd be like, oh, are we gonna pay $3,000 to fly him here for an interview? And how are we gonna time that? That's like the issue involved. But in terms of hiring them, um, as long as their application is competitive, it might be hard for someone, I mean, to have like, you know, fit, you know, is often code for like, you know, like, you know, essentially like, you know, uh, homogeneity for the institution. If you sound like you're from a place different than places might not want you because like, you know, racism and that crap is everywhere. Um, but in, but I mean, if, but in general, like, you know, uh, we, we hired a Chinese scientist in our department. We hired a guy who was working in Australia, um, who actually like lives in LA, but he was in Australia at the time. Um, and so geographically and citizenship wise, uh, our institution doesn't give a darn. Yeah, same same here. Um, it's it's not even a consideration if 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 the person's the right person, then they will sponsor them for the visa. Um, if if we get a chance, I, I would love to talk about the visiting assistant professor positions because there's been a lot of questions about those. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you want to do that now or later, but yeah, I think um, I think that VAPs are a thing that are kind of amorphous and and misunderstood. Um, uh, so yeah, please please talk about VAPs. Um, so one thing I would say is that they are, like, they, they are not, they, are, they can be very, very different. So um, the one that I had, um, again, was through that Consortium for Faculty Diversity. Um, but even through that, they're not necessarily the same. Um, some of the more wealthy PUIs see them as almost like um, open training for future PUI pr um, faculty. Um, and like Terry just said, a lot of apps are sabbatical replacement positions. Um, mine was not. Um, Amherst has, again, lots, they have a huge endowment. Um, and so it was a funded position. My, sal my salary was comparable to um, almost what I'm making as an assistant professor. They gave me a startup. I had my own lab. I was able to um, develop my own courses. Um, and so it, I wasn't 
just there to fill in another spot, which is often what they are. Um, and so it's really important to understand that there's a huge, like much like there's lots of different kinds of PUIs, there's lots of different kinds of apps, um, but there are some really great ones um, that will give you that. Um, and the other thing that the, the VAPs had at, at Amherst is um, they actually had um, specific um, training, like pedagogical training for the incoming um, professors. And so I actually got a lot of my pedagogical training through that position. And I was there for two years. And absolutely, I got the position that I have now because of that VAP. Yeah, mine was pretty different. Um, it was a very last minute one. Someone in the department got pulled up to an administrative position. And so they very last minute needed someone to teach those classes. Um, and as I said, they actually approached me about it. So I didn't apply for it. And I actually negotiated to have it be a little bit less teaching. So I'd have a little more time for research. And I got really lucky. They like paid me very generously, even though I had a lower teaching load. And the Although I didn't have any sort of like formal training or time dedicated to research, I was lucky in that the class that I taught both semesters was this team taught introductory class. And so I had my own section, but everyone kind of taught similar things. So I got a lot of um, just like advice and resources from other people who are teaching the other sections of the same class at the same time. So um, I got a lot of like hands on, but informal like teaching training through that just by working with other people and I see uh, Terry's um, entering a lot into the chat and to remind everybody that we will be saving this chat and turning the responses into um, a Q&A that everyone can read in our resource packet um, is there anything else you want to add about VAPS um, so, so I think some people think of these positions. So I think if you want a job at a teaching focus institution, then this is the way to go because it really communicates, wow, you actually took a job at a teaching focus institution. But that said, um, I can imagine that some people might perceive this as a career dead end for some types of R1 positions. I don't know how many people who have visiting assistant professor positions ends up having a job at like a major research institution. Um, I would imagine that that would be frowned upon when you're applying because they're like, well, why are they applying for this job? If they, I mean, maybe people tried it out and they figure out they didn't like it. Ultimately, it's like, can you get the grants? Can you publish? Can you run a big lab? Is like matters to them. Um, and so maybe you could communicate that, but usually that's not what a VAP does. So I think the key thing from a VAP does is basically you get the stamp of approval from one institution saying, this person teaches well, they were good enough for us to, on a short term basis, so they could be good enough for you, you know, you know, for a tenure track position. Um, and so, so I think in that way, it's, it's invaluable. Yeah. Yeah. And it could also potentially on that note, be a source of a really strong recommendation letter um, for your application package. Um, and so this is kind of related to a VAP, maybe like a pre VAP lifestyle question. There was been a lot of questions about what to do during your postdoc, um, whether to do it at an R1 or if there's a PUI postdoc position available. Um, can you take an adjunct position when you're a postdoc? Um, can anybody speak to, um, you know, whether to do a traditional research postdoc or one with a teaching component, et cetera? Um, so, so I've been on enough. I'm sorry, Priscilla, were you going to talk? I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. So, um, so I have, you know, the advantage of having been on a few search committees in the last few years. So look at all these applications and then see who we eventually hired and who got on the short list or whatnot. And I think it's really variable um, in that um, we realize that when people take a postdoc because there's geographical constraints and there's also like you just need a freaking job. Um, and so, uh, and we wouldn't necessarily hold that against anybody. Um, and so it's not as if we're looking for the person who has the perfect opportunity afterwards. Um, in general, the standard or for people to have postdocs that are ones, because that's where the funding is and that's what people often do when you finish. Um, but then I think what makes you stand out is that you have something in your record that shows that you are into teaching. And so I would say half the people that we hired had moonlighted at community colleges or as an adjunct, like at a Cal State University or something like that, while postdocing, they just did it on the side and their PI is like, oh, I mean, not a lot, but just to show you're an instructor of record on a course. And that, so that way, when you're interviewing, you can be like, yeah, 
I know what it's like to teach a full class. It's different from TA and then you can speak about that with credibility, but also then you know for yourself whether or not that's true as well. Um, so I think almost anything you do is fine. Some postdocs, and I suspect in genetics, this is probably more common, like w wouldn't really um, have many opportunities for, be able, for you to be able to teach. Now that's, that's a problem. You need to find some way to get student mentorship in and ideally teaching. I would say, again, not teaching is not a death knell for your application, but you need to sh communicate that this is something that you're interested in, that you're, um, that you have placed as a priority. And so you figure that at some point you would have found the opportunity to do it one way or the other, and because it would structure your career choices. Yeah, I was just going to add, I, so when I was thinking about postdocs, I got the advice from former, my former faculty members at Kenyon, who they said, don't do one of the teaching postdocs. And this is just a small number of people's opinions. They said, sometimes those t tend to be so teaching intensive that you don't get the quality of research done that you need to do. But I actually don't think that that really was correct advice because there's a, a young woman who's at um, UVA who's a total hotshot in her field and she did a teaching postdoc at Emory, like an Arachta postdoc and then got a, a position in her first year as at UVA, which is a major research institution and she has a Mira and everything now. So um, if I, that was advice I got and I don't think it was necessarily right. I think those um, teaching postdoc programs can be really strong and produce strong researchers and strong teachers. <laughs> Okay, um, awesome. Uh, I have a, another question that's a little um, unrelated to what we've been talking about, but uh, there are a lot of PUIs that have religious affiliations. And so I was wondering if any of you could speak to how desirable or feasible is it for somebody to apply to a PUI with a religious affiliation if one does not personally subscribe to those religious beliefs? Uh, I was a faculty member at as a lapsed Catholic, not, not like I ever really was Catholic, but I was raised in a Catholic family. So technically Catholic, you know how that goes. Um, and so I thought, oh, well, this would be an in for a job to work at a Catholic institution. Um, about, and so it turns out at that institution, at the dean level and above, everybody has to be like actually Catholic, like go to church Catholic and all that. Um, and it actually um, it was, a, a, was a problem for me um, in that it was a bad cultural fit. Um, where uh, th like the institutional priorities were different from mine. Like they, um, like, you know how campuses give out condoms? It's like, you can't give out condoms. Um, and there was a gay faculty member, this was like, like 10, 12 years ago, that had trouble getting tenure because they were gay. Like, right? Uh, and so, um, but that said, you know, uh, where they say any port in a storm, like you need a job, you need a job. A good friend of mine just took a job at Marquette, which is the Catholic institution, but she's like, but I have a job. Um, and I think it depends on the culture of the place. Um, for places that are like fundamentalist, um, where you have to sign like uh, a statement of faith and basically not teach evolution and stuff, you know, I mean, if that's how you roll, I guess, but, um, but for me personally, actually, you know, it was an issue. And I, and even though on the interview, everyone reassured me it wasn't an issue, it still was. So, you know, be careful. Yeah, and I think there's such a broad range of religiously affiliated schools. Like Kenyon is technically Episcopalian, like a bishop sits on the board of Kenyon, but there's not really any practical implication to that in any way. Um, and, but then at the far, ex end of the spectrum like Terry was just saying there are schools some schools you actually have to write a faith statement as part of the application process so that would be like a pretty strong indication um, but also there are a few schools that like can't get federal funding because they have certain practices that are viewed by the federal government as discriminatory and so like you couldn't even apply for grants if you went to a school like that so um, thank you. Uh, so I want to be respectful of everyone's time and I'm going to try to cap us off at about 1130 Pacific time. Um, so my last question uh, is, is a very big amorphous one that you can take into account anything that's going on um, in the world today. Um, how do you think higher education will change in the next 20 years? 
um, Priscilla, you signed up to, to start off this answer. Yeah, so this is interesting. This actually came up in one of my interviews and I, this is specifically about PUI higher education is that some of the small liberal arts colleges are um, seriously planning for financial hardship in the future years. Um, the, like not the Williams and Amherst than the like huge endowment ones, but the ones that don't have such big endowments. And I actually had an interview where my very first meeting was with like the VP of finance and he was like, you need to know that like we face hard times ahead. And that's because like the number of students who are going to college is going to decrease because um, there was kind of like a baby bust uh, around the time of the recession. And so college age students are just gonna decline in the future. Um, and so it's something to take into consideration. I was kind of surprised they were actually that open about it on that interview, um, but it, is something to know um, like the the cost of higher education keeps getting higher and students or schools have to give out more financial aid to make up the gap to maintain like an inclusive and diverse environment and so um, I think from a school standpoint there are especially at the smaller schools there are going to be financial um, difficulties and that was before COVID and COVID has just really wreaked havoc on top of that so yeah yeah, so yeah, so about 10% of and there's gonna be about a 10% drop in enrollment in the next 10 15 years um, nationwide and that's pr gonna be felt principally at the low endowment private institutions um, that are less selective essentially and so um, and as a result, you know, they're really hard financial times and so I would think twice about looking at a job at the institution about how they're managed the size of the endowment and how that endowment is managed um, because the last thing you want to do is be a faculty member for 15, 20 years at a small liberal arts college um, and then have it shut down because that's a really hard in that position. Um, so I guess the one piece of advice I have about this, which um, I got early on, which thank goodness I paid, paid attention to it, is that genuine tenure is portable. Meaning that you, you're only tenured insofar as you're competitive for a job elsewhere. Right? So people think that tenure locks them into a job in a particular institution, but places change, places can go bankrupt, you could have bad leadership move in, earthquakes and storms can happen, like at Tulane, for example, and institutions change their priorities. And so real tenure means that you need to maintain yourself being competitive for a job, um, even if you were to lose the job at the, position, the tenured position that you have. So I think if, you're sh if your career plan is to find a place, get tenure, and be there forever, which sounds so wonderful. Keep in mind that not only do you change as a human being, but institutions change too. Thank you. Um, does anyone else want to say anything else about um, the future of higher education? I mean, I guess I don't have anything like data driven <laughs> to say, but um, I guess I'm curious how like COVID and the the switch to online learning is going to change um, things. I'm guessing like the small selective liberal arts colleges are going to go back to a mostly fully in-person model, but some of these other schools that are facing more financial difficulties, like maybe a creative way to make money would be to have like lower tuition online classes or something. I, I have no idea. I have no basis to this, but um, I, I do suspect that there may be some shifts uh, across the board to include more online based learning. Excellent. Uh, well, thank you all so much for your time. Um, before we leave, I would love um, for uh, you to um, just share verbally or in the chat um, how people can engage with you, your institute, or PUI careers. Um, so some of you have I've already sent me some um, specific uh, links that I can share as well, but feel free to pop those in the chat or say them out loud. I, uh, I'm Ormiga on Twitter, um, and also there's my blog, Small Pond Science. What I think I'm going to do, actually, I'll do set this up this afternoon. I'm going to set up an open thread on my blog for just Q&A so people can ask questions in the comments, and then within the next day, I or anyone else can write responses. Um, and there's enough people reading that so that uh, you'll probably get a variety of interesting responses. Excellent. And I just popped in uh, some of the books that you all have mentioned either to me uh, in planning this or um, throughout the presentation today, including um, Terry's book 
and a book on scientific teaching and creating significant learning experiences, which can be found online or through a local bookstore on indiebound.org. Um, yeah, thank you all so much. If you have any other closing statements you'd like to share, um, please do. But I've had such a great time learning from you all. And I love that this conversation has been going on for so long. Um, thank you. I just really quickly wanted to address one of the questions that was in the um, post job search about collaborations and cross department courses. Um, at liberal arts colleges, that is absolutely not only um, welcomed, but encouraged. Um, so I created a scientific communication course, um, and there are courses that are like cross listed in French studies and biology and things like that. So at, at the small liberal arts colleges, that is actually a selling point. Excellent. Yes. And if there's any questions, uh, sorry, that um, we didn't get to that you saw you wanted to answer, please feel free to do that now. So I was just going to say good luck to everyone. Figure out your careers. Um, I'm happy to answer more questions by email or I can even stay on a little longer if needed. Um, and if you're specifically looking for a two body uh, situation, don't give up hope. There are lots of creative ways to make it work and it just takes some patience. <laughs> Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Have a great day. Good luck with the news. Thank you. I got like way behind on answering questions in the chat. I don't know if you want to like create a Google Doc and we can like type answers in later or something. Um, I like could not listen and type at the same time. Yeah, yeah. how Terry was doing that. Um, <laughs> I, I made no promises about unanswered questions being answered, but we can, we can do that. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm happy to try. I mean, there's just a ton, but I'm happy to try to like sift through and if there's some that we didn't get to. Um, I feel like we covered a lot of territories. So. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, it's like this is your job or something, <laughs> answering people's questions. Amanda, can we like take out the non GSA yeah. people? At this I'm point? doing that right now. Oh, thank you. Okay. I'm kicking people out. Just, <laughs> I'm going to stop recording. <laughs>